Well, guess what? It's time for another summer road trip. So I'm going to three different staff person's houses. I'm gonna pick them up and I'm gonna take them on an adventure that they can't do this year. This year, we're going RV. We're here in Sportville, South Carolina, and I'm picking up Steve Fuentes. He is our first impressions director and our brand new online campus director. Now, I'm picking him up because I really want to pick up his son, Julian. What is going on? It's Steve Fuentes and Julian, his son, Today, you are RVing with Roop and the intern. And the intern, okay. and, and, Ed. and Ed. So here's what we're doing. See, we're in this series, it's called Road Trip, right? Mm -hmm. We're studying the life of Abraham. So Abraham does this whole thing where God tells him to go and he goes, right? And it's crazy. <laughs> and so we, he starts going and then he reaches, and he has no idea where he's going. God just tells him to go, he goes, and when he shows up, a famine is in the land. But here's what's crazy. The, the question at that point is, who is he going to trust? Is he going to try to take things in his own hands? Is he going to trust God? So today, this is all about trust. Julian, the reason you're here today is because you just turned 15. Uh, yes. And you're thinking about preparing yourself to drive. Yes. And you're going to be getting places and going places, right? Yes, sir. So today, you're in charge of helping to get us where I need us to go. And if you get us there in time, you're gonna win a $50 gift card. Nice. If you fail to get us there in time, All right. then you are gonna get to punish your dad. Now the motivation is, is do you want $50 more than you wanna hurt your father? Yeah, I do. Okay, if that's the case, then you are the perfect candidate for this job. We're going to Fuel Park okay. in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Okay. See, that's not too hard, is it? Oh, but you can't use your phone. Okay. Intern, you're gonna have to use one of these. Do you know what one of these is? I think it's a map. It's a map. So Julian, we're stopping here. We're, we at least took you to one park. You're at the entrance of your cul-de-sac. That's it's okay. A, it's normally a 20 the minute drive. We're giving you 30 minutes. Oh, that's wonderful. Two lifelines at any point you wanna use them. One of those lifelines, you can ask one question to anybody. They don't even have to be here. You can call them, anybody. You can ask Listen, one question. Don't call question. your mom. Number two, <laughs> okay. your second lifeline we'll you life is line. you can ask right. any question to the intern. And he has never seen a map either. Hey dad, um, where are we on this map? <laughs> Probably about here. Very good. We are going to turn left. Turn left, bus driver. We're turning left. I think we should lose a minute because somebody is giving way too much advice. You're now at 22 minutes. How you got eight minutes there? left. You just lost a minute. There? Listen, if I just lost a minute, son, you need to listen to what I said. What did you say? Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> what did you find out? Anything? Uh, a U-turn would be great. All right, everybody. Uh, we're here at Fuel Park. The bad news is Julian didn't succeed in the challenge. He missed it by nine minutes. So the $50 is gone. However, he gets to do something spectacular to his father. Julian, we have a gift. I'm gonna take this, and you get to pie your father well, in the on. face. Tonight. Go for it. I, wait, wait, wait. I taught him. Oh. Yeah, that's what I thought. You know what? The twist is, as the person who's in charge, I get to participate. Oh. I get to participate in this as well. And, uh, that's good, that's good. You know what, I'm just thinking, that's... Carson is the intern, that... and he hadn't had any fun at all today. Ed, you've been driving and driving and driving, getting in on this. This is amazing. The camera guys, why would they not participate? Oh, I Anthony! No, I'm, I'm not gonna. All right, Anthony's gonna be nice. Anthony they wouldn't go, but but Tim's not gonna be nice. Yeah, actually, it's kind of refreshing. 
Perfect that timing. Was, that was awesome. Perfect hey, timing. Right when his mouth was open. How does it taste? Hey, it tastes like whipped cream. <laughs> All right, we are in week two, everybody. Summer road trip. And what's really cool, um, again, we're in this phase two process. We've invited some people to be here today as we're filming, which is really cool from me communicating, get a little energy in the room. Uh, but also, you're probably watching at our watch party or maybe you're on the road driving or doing whatever that you do. Maybe at a pool. That'd be a great place to watch this. Maybe that's what I'll do um, one of these days. So uh, we're super excited that you're here and are part of this and excited about this series that we're doing as well. So um, here's what I have. A map. You might be familiar with these things. Uh, this is uh, what we used here just a second ago, and it was pretty amazing what we got to do. So now back in the day, for those of you that are, that are younger, I think that like a lot of people know what a map is. They maybe have seen a map or whatever, but not a lot of us have used a map. Because even back in the day when people were using maps, they didn't, they, you know, a lot of people just didn't use them or whatever. Now here's my problem. Back in the day, I used to use maps when we traveled. And there was no phones, there was nothing like that. You had to use a map to get from point A to point B. Now, I don't know if you know this, but roads sometimes change. Maybe the map's old and some things aren't there anymore. And there would be times, I know I, this is shocking when you hear me say this about myself, but there have been a few times I might've got lost. And so here's, here's what you think you would do. You know, you basically got a couple of options, right? You know, I could, I could, you know, I could stop and ask somebody, Maybe somebody that lived there or somebody who knew the way. That would be a great idea. Um, or I could just trust myself, um, which is what I did. I would always trust myself. And that led to some interesting conversations with my wife, uh, most of which can't be said uh, here on the screen because uh, it was highly inappropriate. But and it wasn't, yeah, I say that because then somebody's going to email and say, your wife uses foul language. No, she, she doesn't. <laughs> no, she doesn't. She, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Relax. Don't send the emails because my wife might send you one back. Um, so don't do it. So don't do it. Okay, stop it. Stop it. So here, here's the big thing, even in that moment. Here's the question um, that you have to ask is who do you trust, right? Do you trust yourself that in this place that you know nothing about, uh, that you'll be able to figure it out or somebody who's been there before, right? And so we're going to kind of delve into that today and really answer that question on a much higher level spiritually, who do you trust, right? So we're gonna dive into this, this whole thing and it's gonna be pretty cool and we're gonna be ask, answering this question, who do you trust most? That's the big thing, okay? That's our big plan for the day. Y'all ready for this? All right, let's do it. We got a long ways to go. I've got a lot to say. So we started last week, Genesis chapter 12. And if you remember, uh, this is when Abram, so one of our early forefathers, this is you know way back 4,000 years ago. Um, Abram is this guy who's hanging out. God speaks to him and says, I want you to go. And he says, well, where? He said, just go. I'll tell you when you get there. And listen, he packs up everything, literally packs up everything, his whole family, and he takes off just going in some weird random direction. And so he trusts God's call on his life and he went and God shows up, right? God shows up, they find a place, everything's amazing. He's so happy, he's on this mountaintop and it's great, okay? And uh, so he builds an altar, celebrates the whole bit. Now, that's, that was the end of last week. Where we're gonna pick up today is between 12 and we're gonna go all the way to 15 real quickly and then we're gonna sit in chapter 15. Because here, here's what happens. After, after this happens, this whole craziness happens, um, Abram all of a sudden arrives in this land, he does all this stuff, and he's on this mountaintop experience with God, and then everything from that point forward for the next 10 years is not gonna be good. And, and, and it's kind of, you know, it's, it's the whole thing. You know, he trusts God, he goes, he has this mountaintop experience, he builds an altar, he celebrates, and then there's this valley or this, it's like a roller coaster ride is the way I kind of think about life sometimes. You know, you have these high tops and then there's these valleys when things aren't so great. And sometimes it's our fault, sometimes it's circumstantial. In his situation, as soon as he arrives, God calls him to this place, he does what he's supposed to do, he arrives and he arrives to a famine. So now they had this huge famine in the land and he says, well, I'll solve it. I'll fix this problem. Rather than trusting God, he says, I'm gonna fix it. And you know what he does? He heads to Egypt 
to fix the problem and he pimps out his wife to the king of Egypt. Yeah, I know, crazy, <laughs> crazy. Uh, and so that was a, a catastrophe. And then you go down a little bit further and it keeps getting crazier because then all of a sudden his, his nephew Lot in this weird battle that happens in a land, he's swept up in it, taken off, and he's got to put a little band of brothers together, and he's going to go to war himself and going to go rescue Lot and bring him home. I mean, it's just a mess is what's going on. And that's where we find ourselves here in 15. So here's what I want to throw out to you. When you think about this roller coaster ride, the, the big thing that we want to take away from that is this concept. Trials... These kind of trials are the crossroads. I mean, trust, trials are the crossroads to trust. I'll get it out eventually. It just takes a little bit of time. Trials are the crossroads to trust. It's in these trials and these circumstances in life when everything seems to be falling, uh, falling apart that it becomes these moments that become crossroads when we are gonna figure out whether we're gonna trust God deeper or we're not. We're gonna trust ourselves and take it to a whole nother weird level. So let's take a look at 15, uh, and I will, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, I've been preaching now for well over 25 years, closer to 30, but that just seems like that's a big number. Um, I don't feel 30, so that doesn't seem possible. I was. I was three years old when I started preaching, and I have never preached this text. And so as a matter of fact, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to shoot you straight. I, I, I was going to preach on an earlier chapter and then as I was digging into this, as, I'm not gonna say when, but it might've been like Monday. Um, it, I, just, I just went to this text and I was like, no, nah, I, gotta, I, gotta I gotta do this one. Uh, this is crazy because I love these crazy stories because when you read it, you're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I mean, it's insane. Most of us maybe have read this. I would doubt that many of us have heard sermons on this because there's not too many people as stupid as I am to preach it. Because um, when you read it and you go through it, it's like, man, this is craziness. So I wanna dive in. And let's see how this goes. You ready? Chapter, chapter 15, verse one. Uh, we'll put it up here on the screen. Let's walk through this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not. Now remember, after these things, that's everything that we just talked about, particularly chapter 14, which is when this weird thing with Lot happens in the war. That's what's immediately uh, before this. So keep that in mind. So it's this roller coaster, the trials happen. And after this, the word of the Lord comes to him, to Abram in a vision. And, it, and, and God says this, fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very very great. It's a very interesting uh, text and, and a couple of things that you'll find maybe particularly interesting because we just, uh, during this whole COVID, when it first started, one of the first things that we started saying was, hey, uh, fear not, stand firm. And so this text talks about fear not, but here's what makes that very interesting. This is actually the first time that, that um, encouragement from God is used in scriptures. It's right here. It's going to be used over 70 times throughout scripture but this is the first, as uh, Abram's facing a trial, God says, hey, look, fear not. And then of course, um, there's also this encouragement that comes to him, uh, fear not, Abram, I am your shield. So all this stuff you're going through, I'm here, I'm gonna protect you, I'm gonna walk you through this. You can trust me, just get behind me, trust me. And then he says this, and this is where it gets weird. Your reward shall be very great. Now I told you, it's been 10 years. 10 years, right? Um, at 75 years old, Abram takes off, trust God, you know, he's not a spring chicken. He goes off, carry, takes everything with him and it's 10 years and God said at 75, I'm gonna give you a son, you're gonna have nations, right? All this bad stuff has happened in 10 years and then here you come saying, your reward was gonna be great. It's like, hey, listen, I listened to you, I trusted you, I went. This isn't working out too well for me. You know, this is craziness, God. I, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure that you understand what a reward is because <laughs> this doesn't feel like one. You're killing me. So here's what happens. Check out his response, right? Verse two. But Abram said, oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, you have given me no offspring and a member of my household would be my heir. So basically that's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, God, this has not been good. It's 10 years, it's been terrible. And I left everything, I'm trusting you and it ain't working out for me. 
That's basically what this verse is saying. I mean, I, you know, seriously, are you even there? And I, and I feel like, you know, I think about my faith. Um, you know, many of us, we, we have these moments where we say, okay, God, I'm gonna follow you. And we give him everything. We start trusting him. We maybe have a moment, a spiritual moment that's really deep and really rich. But then all of a sudden the wheels fall off. Things get difficult. Life gets hard. Circumstances beyond your control, mistakes that you make. And I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if you've ever reached this point to where you kind of feel like maybe God has let you down, asked you to do something and he's not really showing up. And here's what I think oftentimes even happens. We begin, oftentimes when we trust God in big ways and then it goes quiet for a while and we're just kind of trudging along, what ends up happening is we begin to lose faith. We begin to lose confidence. We begin to lose trust. So God's gonna speak into this and this is where we see this significance begin to happen. So take a look at verse five. And behold, the word of the Lord came to this man, this man, and this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Let's go ahead and read verse five. And he, and he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now, I don't, I don't know what this moment is was like. Oh, we, we're reading this, and this doesn't feel dramatic, but it has to have been dramatic. It's, it's basically God saying, he's reminding him of the promise. Remember, I promised you that, you that you're gonna have a son and, and you're gonna have all these things. It's gonna be amazing, right? He reminds him, but he does it in a way that when he takes him outside, shows him the stars, that moment had to have been significant. Something happened, and let me tell you why, because the next verse is a pivotal verse for our faith, it, it's, it's huge. So notice what he says. So after this happens, and it's not gonna feel like it when you first read it, but let's just walk through it and I'll show you what happens. And here's what happens in verse six. And he believed the Lord. And he believed the Lord, but check this out. And God counted it to him as righteousness. Now listen, there's probably not a lot of verses, you know, there's, you know, verses, I don't know if you can rank them, but if you could, this would be one of the biggies. You know, one of the more significant ones. Let me tell you why. It's a key verse because in all of the Bible, this is referenced three times in the New Testament pointing back to this. And the question is, is why is this so significant? Because this is dealing with the concept of salvation. And we have not seen it to this point yet. We'll see it later, but this is early on. You're talking 2,000 years before Jesus even comes. God does this thing where he, where he says, this is gonna be counted to you as righteousness. And what that means is, is that you have been made right. You've been made right by what? what? What has made him right? His belief. It's insane because, again, this is answering the big lifelong struggle that we have. The New Testament deals with it significantly. It references this several times. Is it based on what you do or is it based on what you believe? Is it based on your faith? Is it faith or is it works? I mean, that's the big question that's at hand, but check this out. This, this is not just any kind of belief. So let me, let me walk you through the word. This is a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word was aman. And Amon, so you think about it, let me, this is like, like a, a confident, strong, you know, certain, certain belief. Now, the difference is there's two types of belief, if you think about it. And, and let me put the first one up there. The first type of belief is this acknowledging belief. It's where me and you may know something to be true and we agree upon it and say, oh yeah, yeah, I believe that, you know, and there's an agreement. It's nothing more than what? Cognitive. It's just in my head. You know, we have it. it. There's nothing significant about it. There's a second type of belief that is called the anchoring type of belief. And an anchoring belief is that belief that goes beyond just a cognitive um, understanding of it, but now it becomes personal and it becomes something what I call kind of a steering type of faith. In other words, it's so strong and I'm so certain about it. And it's this thing that I believe has, has impacted me so greatly that it now steers and guides me in life. It's a life altering type belief. And that's what this is referring to. And isn't it crazy? All of his trials, it's been 10 years and all of these things that have happened to him, these trials meandered to this point where he has this encounter with God that he then for that moment, like, I get it. And it changes him. 
He's radically changed. This, this word is where we get the word amen from. Amen comes out of Ammon. You know, so in other words, I kind of see this as the moment as if, as if Abram heard this promise and he says to God, amen. You know, Jesus used it over and over again. You know, in the phrase that he'd say, truly, truly, I say unto you, that's amen and amen. With certainty, I'm telling you, you can trust this, that amen comes from this word in the Hebrew language. So what in the world happened? And again, I'm not sure what happened. What that moment was when God guides him out. I don't know if that's like a James Earl Jones moment and he's standing there and God's like, look up into the heavens. And he's just like, wow, I don't, I don't know. But something so significant that it changed him forever to where he all of a sudden now has this deep rooted belief. And that's the question for you today. Listen, do you trust the Lord? Do you trust God, this kind of Amon trust, personal, confident. And a lot of times, let me just share with you this. When you're getting discouraged and you feel like, man, I feel like I live on this roller coaster. My life is up and down and up and down. I've had these high moments, low moments. And maybe you're saying, dude, this is not a roller coaster. This is just a pure out valley. I haven't been on an up in forever. And you're reminded what we started out at the beginning. Let's put it up here again. Trust are the crossroads to trial. Trust, it's, I mean, trials are the, I don't know why I keep doing that. Trials are the crossroads to trust. It's in these trials that we have this moment when we can lead us to this deeper faith in God. Now, so here's where the craziness kicks in. So what is then, so now he's had this moment, this belief has happened. Now what happens? What changes with him and God? And this is the craziness, you ready? So verse seven, let's just dig right in. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. This is crazy because it's like God's introducing himself again. Like, you know, we've been talking this whole time. You know, now you're gonna tell me who you are again. Okay, no, but, but the reason that's there and when God does that and he introduces himself, what he's basically saying, he is sort of like a king being pronounced. And what I'm getting ready to say is significant. It becomes sort of like a very legal type situation. And, and he's saying to him, I'm gonna give you the land to possess. But notice verse eight. I, I think this is uh, hilarious. So God says, hey, also I'm gonna give you the land. You remember all this land that we talked about? I'm gonna give it to you. And then we had six, mountaintop belief. God's like, you're righteous now. You've been made right. Seven, I'm gonna give you the land. Having this big proclamation moment. Verse eight, notice what Abram says. Abram said, oh God, oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? I told you, it only took one verse, one verse, and it's over. He's back to doubt again. And I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna shoot you straight. This is probably my favorite part of this whole story. And I'll, because I feel like this is me. You know, so many people, they, they, they think of pastors, and they say, man, he must have it all together. He's got it all figured out. Now, dude, I doubt, I struggle. I sometimes I'm not sure. Listen, there are times I'm preaching, I walk off and go, what did I just say? That's insane. And so here's what you need to know. Here's what you need to know. And this is just, I'm gonna do this real quick. Doubt is a doorway to deeper trust. And I know what happens is oftentimes church people are weird. Religious people in general are weird. We, we do this thing where we want to be self-righteous. We, you know, we're good. Anytime that there's this, we're, a, we're good. And, and what I mean by that, worldly good, because obviously none of us are good in light of who God is. But we think we're good. And then we, we want to impose that goodness on people. And anytime they do anything that doesn't feel like it's right or righteous, we then look at them and say, oh, you're no good. And we want to belittle them. And you're a loser, you're a failure, you've sinned. But I want you to know this. Doubters are always always welcome in the presence of God. And, and there are lots of examples, but the most famous one is Thomas. And as soon as I say that, you have a thought, but let me share, share with you this. In, in John chapter 11, um, Jesus is going off and Thomas looks at the disciples and he says, let us go with him and let's die. Now we don't bring that up when we talk about Thomas, why? Because when we bring Thomas up, what do we bring up? Yeah. Doubting Thomas. 
that Thomas is the one who said, hey, I'm not believing this till I see the holes in your hand and the hole in your side. And when he says that, what did Jesus say to him? Come, touch, see, feel, experience. And I just want you to know this. This is kind of like a sidebar to everything, but Jesus is ready and willing to engage you in your doubts. Why? Because it's in your doubts. These doubts become doorways to a deeper faith and trust in him. He's not afraid of it. He says to you, come. And man, that just, you know, that just encourages me. I don't know if it does you. So let's keep going because we still haven't got to the crazies. He asked this question of God. God does not rebuke him. As a matter of fact, God is gonna enter into a covenant now with him. And he, and he basically, as a response to this, so what are we gonna do? God says, okay, here's what you do. Take a look. We're getting ready to go down crazy land, right? This is cuckoo land, but just hang tight. You're gonna read it, don't turn it off. You're gonna wanna twist, you're gonna wanna stop what you, don't, stay with me. He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat, a goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, sounds like Christmas, and a young pigeon. Okay, let's go to 10. That's not the crazy part, that's just interesting. And he brought, and he brought him all of these. This is Abram. So Abram brought them and he cuts them in half. He lays one on one side and one on the other side, but he didn't cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, so he's cutting them all up. The birds are there where they're like dinner and they're down there trying to eat it. Abram's like, no, go on, shoo, shoo. I don't know how far we're going here. Let's do 11, let's do 11. Oh, we already did 11. That was 11. Let's stop. Let's stop. Because, listen, you read this story. I hope you're not a part of PETA, because this one would be a tough one. This one's a doozy. Uh, animal lovers are already going, I don't love God anymore. I know. Forget him, freak. Um, so, keep in mind, this is a culture 4,000 years ago. And so it's very important. I'm gonna walk you through this and hopefully this is gonna change your life, okay? So here's what happened. He tells him to go get these things. The reason he says go get these particular ones is because they're of great value. I want you to bring something that is valuable to me. Bring it here. Did you notice that in this verse, he says, go get them. He brings them and he doesn't tell him what to do. He doesn't command him what to do. Abram just begins automatically cutting them, which means this is something he was familiar with. This is something he's done many times before. He just goes into this moment of what we have done before. And what that is, is a cultural thing of a contract or what, what they would call a covenant with one another that they would enter into. Now, there are two types of, of contracts, as you can imagine. The first one, and we'll put them up here, is a paper contract. And that's what we're familiar with. Paper contracts is you lay out what the agreement is or what your oath is, and then you sign your name to it, right? You sign your name. And here's the important part about a paper contract. And you see this, what, in marriages when you buy a house and you put your name on the contract. And when you do, you're saying this, if I break this contract, there will be consequences. Back in this day and time, they, they had what was called an oral contract. An oral contract is one that was entered into with words and by a action that included words. And that's what's taken place uh, in this one right here. So here's how it plays out. I'm just gonna kind of walk you through it. I'm not even sure how I wanna follow my notes. Let me just tell you, Chris Roop, to you, okay? So he cuts these things um, apart. And here's what's crazy. This is, you think, oh, they're just cutting an animal. If, you know, a cow. I don't know if you've ever dressed an animal before. This is not a short process. Uh, probably this whole thing, six, eight hours worth of cutting and, and nastiness. Pure nastiness. Now, I would not. Uh -uh, I'm not a blood person, but they're cutting it up and he's laying it out. It gets kooky. It's gonna sound kooky, but follow me. This is so important. Then he lays it out in the shape of a birth canal. That's all I'm gonna say about that. We won't go into too much details, but just to say that. And the reason for that is, is because in this contract or this covenant, something new is gonna come, an agreement, a new part of this relationship. So there's something being birthed 
out of this. You with me? So he lays it all out. It takes the better part of the day uh, to make it happen. And then all of a sudden, um, when he's done with all of this, uh, what's gonna happen is, what normally would happen is, is that um, two people, they would, the two people in the contract would begin to walk in between the animals. So as you can imagine, it's a bloody mess, right? Because um, they would have robes and stuff on and they're dragging it through and dragging it back. As they're walking back and forth, they're declaring what they are making an oath over. So they're declaring the covenant or the commitment that they're making to one another. And here's the crazy part. And the concept is, is if we do not obey and follow this covenant, if we, if we don't do it, then what's gonna happen is this. We're gonna, be, we're gonna be cut into shreds, laid out so the birds can come feed on our carcass. That, my friend, is a commitment. <laughs> you know, we sign a paper and, oh, well, I'm gonna lose some money or I might go to jail. And now there it's like, no, nah, we're gonna kill you. You're gonna, we're gonna destroy you. I mean, total obliteration. So as you can imagine, their commitments to their covenants was probably a little higher than ours to our contracts. <laughs> Wouldn't we agree? And so here's another piece that would happen. So let's just say that there was a king and he was the greater king. So if he was to enter into a contract with a lesser king or even maybe one of his servants, the king would not walk through the, the animals. Only the other person. And in essence, it's saying, hey, if you don't keep the contract with me, not me with you, you with me, this is what's gonna happen to you. So this greater king mentality uh, kicks in as well. Let's, let's read verse 12 and keep moving as I wanna show you a couple more things. So as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Adam, Abram, excuse me. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. So um, he does this all throughout the day and then all of a sudden, just darkness falls upon him. Now, we're not certain exactly what happened, whether it was something induced by God, but here's what my belief is, is that Adam, I, mean, I keep saying Adam, I don't know what's gotten into me. Abram, um, or Abraham later, Abram all of a sudden realizes as he's doing this uh, contract thing that, oh, wait a minute, I'm the lesser. And, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> that I'm gonna be able to keep this deal. And it begin, the weight of the commitment falls on him. I mean, it's deep. This weight is heavy and, and he falls into this deep sleep where then God begins to speak over him. And then in verse 17, uh, notice what happens. Here's where it really gets fun. So when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. And that feels weird all in of itself. But here's, here's the thing. Uh, think about it. As you think about scripture, anytime that there was smoke or a cloud and then there were fire or torch, it was always what? Do y'all remember? The presence of God. These things represented the presence of God. We see this in several places in scripture. We see it on Mount Sinai. We see it when Moses is leading the people in the desert. And we see it in the book of Acts at Pentecost. All these, there's, there's others too, but all of these moments where God reveals himself. But here's what's crazy. It says, let's go back um, to the verse. And, and a smoke of pot and flaming and torch that was what? Passing what? Between the pieces. Yeah, y'all can talk right here. These three words, between the pieces, right? So, man, this is good stuff right here. This is, this is worth, worth the whole trip right here. So he sees him going back and forth through the pieces. Do you notice what doesn't happen in this text? Abram never goes between the pieces. God does something extraordinary where the greater king then comes and he's walking between the pieces. He doesn't invite him into this deal where he's walking into the pieces. And basically, this is where it gets craziness. You ready? Basically, God is saying this. If I fail, I'll be ripped apart. That's not the good part. If you fail, I'll be ripped apart. The entire weight of the contract, my friend, was on the greater king. 
Listen, my friend, that is the gospel. That's it. Listen, it changed their relationship. In a moment, their relationship instantly changes. Before, there was this weird kind of relationship where God and the slave were in this weird relationship. And in this moment, not just because of this, but also because of this deep faith and this belief that he places in God and now this covenant that God does. And I think Abram knows exactly what's happening. He's saying, this is insane. None of this is on me. It is completely on you. And he goes not from this religious experience, relationship with God. He becomes Abram, the friend of God. Everywhere after this, you've got God and him that are in now this deep friendship. Listen, let's, let's do something. Let's fast forward years later because Abram, the man, Abram in man itself fails. We don't meet God's expectation. We fail in this covenant relationship. God fulfills his promise. How? Because years later, 2,000 years later, God, again, in the person, is going to come through the birth canal and be born as a person, Jesus. And Jesus is going to go to the cross. And on the cross, darkness is going to come. And the weight of man's sin and the weight of of our breaking the covenant is gonna be on him and he's gonna be broken and he's gonna die for us. And that is the gospel. Everything, right? We talked about this last week. The Old Testament is pointing towards the New Testament and Jesus and everything in the New Testament is pointing back towards him. It all kind of comes together. So here's the thing. I still wanna go back to this one moment and I wanna kind of close with this. Um, our trials and our doubt and everything, this disobedience to him as we look back, what happens in that moment, right? I still go back to that moment where he takes him outside and he shows him the stars and everything begins to change. What happens right there? Because that seems kind of crazy to me. So I'll close with this, this story and, and here's what I, I think it plays out. What changes in his relationship uh, in that moment. So 2013 was my, I mean, up, uh, there was no ups, my downs. I mean, it was like the, the year of hell for the roots, for me, for my family. And there was a lot going on that I won't get into, but the kind of the culminating terrible thing that, that we discovered was my wife got ovarian cancer. And so I remember we go to uh, the hospital and we're going to meet with the oncologist and he's going to kind of explain this all to us. And like doctors do, he gets into, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And here's how we're going to do this and whatever. And as a husband, I'm like, you know, it's my responsibility. I got to protect my wife. I've got to make sure. And so I look at the doctor and I say, hey, look, this is new to us. We have no clue what we're doing. Uh, we've never been down this road before. Um, what next steps should we take? I mean, is it wise for me? Do I need to go and uh, talk to another doctor and get some other counsel? Should, you know, any books that we could be reading and preparing ourselves and figuring all this out? You know, what advice would you give me? And I'm not kidding you. This was a crazy moment, right? And the doctor, he looks at me and he says, I don't really care what you do. You can do whatever you want. Go look, go ask questions. And then he turns to my wife I remember because I was thinking, well, that's kind of rude. I thought we were having a conversation here. He turns to my wife and he says, you listen to me. You do what I tell you to do. You do everything I tell you to do, when I tell you to do it, and how I tell you to do it. Now listen, it's gonna be hell. It's gonna be three to six months, pure hell. It's gonna be miserable. You're gonna wish you had died, but you're gonna live. It was like, all right, I'm with this dude right here, you know. And uh, I, I am with you. You know, it was like my wife, it didn't matter. If I would have said, honey, we really need to go to a second opinion, you're stupid, I'm with that guy. You know, I want to live. I like what he said right there. And so here's basically what, what happens. That was all she needed. What she needed was his promise, his commitment, and it was really, if you think about it, it's more than a promise. It's this strong confidence that's behind it. As he laid it out, this strong person, one that she knew, I can trust him. He's telling me the truth. I'm gonna put my trust in him. And I think that's what happened in that moment when he took him outside and he points up out there. And, he, and that was in a moment, just this, 
I am with God and I don't understand why it's been 10 years and the reality is it's gonna be a lot more years, but I believe you and I'm gonna stake my life on it. God walks between the pieces and he makes this covenant with Abraham, which God carries all of the way to this covenant. And that is all that Abram needed was this promise, really more than a promise, right? It's this, this uh, certainty, this confidence, this, this act that God does toward us. And the question is for you and for me, who do you trust most? Because it is so easy. I'm telling you, it is so easy in life right now because um, every decision we make, every step of disobedience comes out of a lack of trust of God. It's when we place ourself, our trust in something else, whether it's a friend, our intelligence, our talents, maybe our career, our jobs, people that we know, whatever, right? We put our trust in something else. And it's always in that moment, this unsteady, uncertain thing over here that always gets us in trouble. And God's saying, hey, that's okay. It's okay to have these, these heels, these bad decisions. It's okay to go through these valleys, but I don't want you to stay there. It's okay that you doubt. I don't want you to stay there. I'm inviting you into something deeper. Do you wanna be a part of this? And because of what Jesus does on the cross, it's no longer on me. It doesn't depend on me to be righteous enough or good enough. It's what he did. And he now sits at the seat of the Father. And when we go before him and we go before God, it's not gonna be based on what we did. It's gonna be simply based on Jesus's word when he says, he's with me. He is with me. Where have you placed your trust? I wanna pray for you. I pray over you. Would you let me do that? Father God, in the name of Christ, people that are listening, whether it's at one of our um, watch parties or God, whether it's online or maybe this is even at a later date, God, I pray that we would be convicted with this question. Who do we trust most? Are we able to declare before God that God, I'm on, I believe and I am with you. And God, there are people um, who, who, who are struggling in their walks with you. God, people that are in the darkest of times in their life, people whose marriages are falling apart, people who are struggling with addictions, people who've lost their jobs, people who feel like that every step they take, it's another step away from you. And Father God, I pray that you would make your presence known just as you did with Abram, that you would reveal yourself to them and lead them to a deeper trust in you. God, we love you. And we commit ourselves to you in the name of Christ, amen. Now listen, uh, as we wrap up, let me just encourage you with a couple of things. We do have a, uh, two different things. If you're at the watch party on campus, uh, immediately following uh, this service, you can go straight out to the Next Steps area. There'll be some people there who'd love to talk to you, answer some questions, maybe to help you to take some next steps. If you're watching, you can do a virtual Next Steps. It'll be happening immediately as soon as we're finished here. Uh, there should be a link on there um, that you can click and go to that virtual place. We would love to talk to you and help you in taking some next steps. And we'll see you next week for part three of Road Trip. Have a great week. Yeah. <clears throat>